Merci beaucoup. Je suis ravie d'avoir été invitée à me joindre à vous. Je suis partie d'un nouveau membre de l'Access, Research Access One, droit et nouveaux rapports sociaux. And I noticed that among the disciplines listed under this axis, which inform the work of researchers, economics is conspicuous by absence. So um, I am an economist, uh, to be precise, a born again economist. Um, um, I had stopped being an economist and now I'm back being one. Um, my graduate work was informed by the trends of the 90s, which was very focused on macroeconomic restructuring of transitional economies. My current work on law and development is greatly influenced by the evolving understanding of the anatomy of institutions, both formal and informal, and the interplay between them and its impact on economic development and human development. The interdisciplinary work from the new institutional economic stream, so likes of Douglas North, Robinson, Ismaglu, Roderick, um, is, is very inspiring in this area. And on the other hand, what inspires me to be back being an economist is the cutting edge work um, on evidence-based socioeconomic policy formulation. To, which is being going on um, to effectively address issues of fundamental so issues fundamental to human dignity. So that would be food, water, sanitation, decent work, education, and this is pretty much dominated by microeconomists and people who work in the area of public policy and political economy. So, Duflo, Otur, Banerjee, Pandey, there are many. Broadly speaking, I would situate my work in the third cycle of law and development stream. And uh, since I am situating myself in the third cycle, I thought that it will be wise to speak briefly about the first and the second cycle. So the first stream or the first cycle of law and development um, uh, research and, and work um, in the field was led entirely by American lawyers and law professors in the late 60s and the 70s. Uh, and in a nutshell, this was promotion of American model of law, um, legal education, and judiciary in Asia, in Latin America, uh, pretty much all over the world. And uh, it was focused on training judges, and lawyers and uh, reforming curriculum uh, in law faculties. And this is where the cynicism comes from, that the rule of law is not merely the rule of lawyers. And this movement naively looked at law as a set of neutral rules devoid of any social, political, and cultural context, and obviously it did not succeed. So 15, 20 years later, the shop was folded and people sort of did not talk much about law and development. Uh, the genesis of the second stream of law and development movement is the Washington Consensus 1989. So this is the period Soviet Union is collapsing under its own weight, Berlin Wall is down, and it frantically sort of efforts are launched for sort of rule of law building efforts. And the model is East Asian Tigers. So it's a very simplistic model that get the policies right, and policies being market creating, market sustaining policies, supporting privatization, deregulation, etc. And um, that happens for a good few years. In 1997-98, uh, Asian Tigers collapse. And suddenly, there is a focus on trying to understand institutional setting where policies are made. So this is the time when both in the academy and in, in practice, there is a lot of thinking about institutions. Institutions matter, primacy of institutions, and of course, good governance. And, uh, and just to give you an example of sort of how good governance sort of took, took up as a concept, um, and governance simply to break it down would be political accountability, quality of bureaucracy, and the rule of law. And there is an, an estimate which is still being used um, quite um, 
actively, and it's the work by Kaufman, uh, that there is a 300% dividend in the long run. Um, a country's income per head rises by roughly 300% if it improves its governance by one standard deviation. So one standard deviation is roughly the gap between India's and Chile's rule of law scores measured by the World Bank. And as it happens, Chile is about 300% richer than India in purchasing power terms. So there are statistical measurements for governance, at least in this school um, of rule of law and development or law and development school. And this is a very state-centered approach, very top-down, and uh, the, there are uh, scathing criticism of this orthodoxy by Tamanaha, Carothers, Tribal Cock, Upham, all of them being legal scholars. And again, the focus being the judiciary and, um, and, and just, just very top down and working with the state in enhancing state capacity. And this state focused, and this continues through the 90s, goes up to 2005. And this state focus has achieved partial success in some context and dismal failure in most and um, contexts. Um, and Russia and Ukraine, all of Central Asia, Caucasus, Sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, the list is long where this hasn't worked. So the top-down orthodoxy, what it has failed to address is the fundamental issues of human dignity and access to justice for nearly four billion people in the world. And according to multiple estimates, uh, nearly four billion people do live without any legal protection and outside the purview of the rule of law. So after 40 years, and I don't know, various estimates give you $40 billion spent on these efforts, uh, four billion people remain outside uh, uh, this framework. So this stark reality acts as a catalyst in 2005 uh, when the UN Commission for the Legal Empowerment of the Poor is commissioned. And this unleashes the legal empowerment of the poor movement with full recognition that top-down and bottom-up effort must be carried out simultaneously. It's not that you abandon state building process and institution building process, but you can no longer ignore the plight of those who are not part um, of these processes. Uh, and instead of this one size fits all model must be res uh, more responsive models uh, to local particularities and contexts and judicious sequencing of reform and institution building starts to happen 2005 onwards. So my work um, now, I just wanted to give you a brief background why. So this is the third stream now, where it is both top-down and bottom-up efforts are happening. And my work, which is on economic justice with a particular focus on food security, strides between the top-down institutional approach and the bottom-up empowerment approach. Theoretical framework I use is, is that of Amartya Sen, which is development as, a free, development as freedom, and capabilities framework, which is Nazbam and Sen, to look at the issue of food security. And particularly in the legal academy, there is so much focus on the justiciability of socioeconomic rights and what courts do, what courts don't do in South Africa. In, um, in, in India, in various places, um, I propose a justice-based framework uh, which, which, is, um, which combines the entitlement approach and the empowerment uh, approach and um, looks at four elements. They are all interconnected strategies, so strengthening institutions, but institutions directly impacting delivery of goods and services to the poor and marginalized improving access to justice, and there are specific strategies, not necessarily using the formal institution route, which is not accessible to, as I mentioned, uh, to many, uh, empowering right holders. And there is a lot of innovative work going on in this area, particularly using cheap ICT, use of information and communication technology. 
and the fourth prong being support, uh, supporting food sovereignty. Um, in India particularly, I have looked at and I continue to look at the use of ICT and how it is revolutionizing um, the uh, empowerment movement. So the biometric identity card, which has been issued to a billion people now, really has started to change the rules of the game in terms of accessing services, accessing subsidized food, um, uh, making a dent in corruption in delivery of services and goods. Um, so that's one thing I look at. The second thing in food security, which currently I'm working on, is looking at the Sustainable Development Goals Framework. Uh, 17 of those goals, uh, there are 17 goals, and 9 of 17 are directly or indirectly intersect with food security. And there is a project I'm working on, which should be finished by September, which is looking at harmonizing policies and initiative in SADAC, Southern African Development Community, and um, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of the West African States, uh, to see how they are coordinating policy initiatives on food security and the four pressing concerns for both regions being climate change, access to information technologies, market infrastructure for food, and conflict and post-conflict issues. So many countries in these two blocks are part of the G7 plus states as well, so frail and fragile states. And uh, these, these are the two blocks where th three out of four countries where famine has been declared uh, sit in these two blocks. So this is a, uh, looking at how what is happening within the SDG framework. And my other half, so this is very specifically focused on food security. Um, the other work which I do with my rule of law and economic development research group and collaborate with um, law students, as I do not have legal training, um, focuses on institutions. Uh, and particularly accountability mechanism and its impact on economic development and distributive justice. So um, there is um, a recently uh, we have um, put together, I have put together a proposal to the SSHRC, um, which the title, I don't know what it means, Institutional Responsiveness as an Instrument of Distributive Justice in China and India. And this comes from a new uh, sort of thinking on governance, that good governance means what? And by working on good governance, you can't fix all parts of a, a large system. So there is a, a, an emerging thinking on good enough governance, good enough for now. Pick and choose institutions to focus on what the priorities are. So poverty alleviation being a priority for many countries, what would be those institution and institutional mechanisms you would like to look at to improve accountability, responsiveness, and uh, administrative capacity of these institutions. So we are looking, um, it, it's, it's a vast uh, area, and it's a project is, is set out to be a, a review of literature uh, and, and all the legislative development happening in this area. So there are four prongs to this project. One, to investigate legislative development and policy changes designed to strengthen the accountability of institutions whose effective functioning has direct implications for distributive justice in India and China, such as those that deliver key goods and services to citizens. And this we have already mapped out in a previous phase of um, this project, but this will go deeper. Second is to analyze responsive efforts to build and strengthen institutions in China. And this we are looking at both demand side institutional reforms and supply side. So there is a lot which has been, um, catalyst has been civil society, so the legal empowerment movement. So things like Right to Information Act, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, all this has come because of mass mobilization. So 
down sort of demand um, led reforms and supply um, led reforms. So that's second. The third is to examine the salient role of information and communication technology in enhancing accountability and governance for sustained economic development and equitable distribution. And lastly, to develop insights on how the sequencing of institutional reforms can lead to higher levels of distributive justice. And this is where I come to the good, good enough governance and sequencing of reforms, because we are reforming institutions is sort of in platitude means very little, uh, but just specifically identifying um, uh, what's going on. And this is informed by um, our previous work on looking at institutions in the context of emerging economies, um, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and um, how informal, formal, and transitional institutions have pay, played specific role in development of these economies. And towards the end, what the conclusion we have come to is that the pendulum might have swung to the other extreme. So from one size fits all model, which was the rule of law orthodoxy of the 90s and 2000 up to 2005, now I think it's too particularistic, laissez-faire, let them do, it's, you know, it's, we must respect the local. And it has gone, at least in the academy, a lot of writing is about very particularistic models, which we argue are detrimental to what we, the nebulous conception of what we call core tenets of the rule of law. And um, the three elements for us in the core tenets are responsiveness, accountability, and enforceability. And, um, and there is, um, I'm happy to answer questions on this aspect. Uh, but so that work is now being carried out with a more focus on the distributive justice element in the context of India and China. So uh, it is a, I just wanted to present some of what I'm doing and a little bit of background since I do not know whether any of you do work in the area of law and development. So I thought I'll just give a little bit of background why the third cycle uh, now. So thank you very much for your attention. Merci beaucoup de votre attention. So I'm speaking to you today about taking a stand at Standing Rock, Native American sacred sites and natural resource development projects. Uh, can I have a brief indication, anybody here more or less au fait with what has been happening at Standing Rock in the United States? Yes? yes. Okay, that gives me an idea. Quickly, I am going to introduce you to what I do in my research, uh, two key concepts that I'm going to discuss with you. And then I want to use Standing Rock to illustrate my research problem to you. I'm going to discuss the twin strategies that they've been following, which is a political strategy and their legal strategy. Um, so we will be proceeding from there. So regarding my research, I am in my fourth and final year at the, Universi at the Université de Montréal at this stage. My research director is um, Dean Jean-François Coudreau de Bien. You have my topic up there. Um, all I can maybe point out at this stage is that the tangible refers to natural resource development projects, intangible to sacred indigenous sites, and I will be referring to that a bit later on. So in my theoretical framework, I have three main elements. The first one is indigenous theory and legal anthropology that I combine, and I do so so that the one can balance out any weaknesses in the other, which is contentious. Secondly, um, I have international law, but I would like to emphasize that I do not, this is not a public international law thesis. I am looking at international law as applied in my four jurisdictions that I am comparing. Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. And the way in which I do this is to look at each of the jurisdictions to 
consider the positive law, as it were. I then have a desktop study that I proceed with. Um, and when I have looked at the desktop study and, and considered whether the facts work or not in terms of the law, I then construct a context-sensitive framework for each of these jurisdictions. Regarding my research problem, it is the basic conflict between hard money and spiritual values. My main concern being that many of these natural resource development projects are measured in monetary terms. And how do you really measure culture and spirituality in a monetary term? So my four desktop studies, I introduce you to them briefly. And I call them desktop studies because I do not do any field work. I am not equipped, I am not trained to do any field work. Uh, but also, it really, it's the facts in those studies that interest me, more than necessarily what the people think and feel about it. Um, so I proceed from there. The first one, you may know about Kitanoha Nation and Katsmuk in British Columbia in Canada. It was before the Supreme Court on December 1st of last year. They have been trying to develop Jumbo Glacier Ski Resort for the past 20 years now, and Kitanoha Nation has been fighting it for as long. Kitanoha Nation says that the grizzly bear spirit lives in the Jumbo Valley in the Jumbo Mountains, which is in the Purcell Mountain region of British Columbia. And that if this ski resort is constructed, the, the grizzly bear spirit will leave. The grizzly bear spirit is at the core of their spiritual beliefs. So their spiritual beliefs and their practices will be rendered basically meaningless if that proceeds. The second one in the United States, I have a band, a, non -federally, a federally non-recognized Indian tribe called the Winnemem Wintu in Northern California in the United States. The picture up top there, you see what is Shasta Dam. It's a reservoir that was created in the late 1930s, early 1940s. They flooded 90% of the traditional territory of the Winnemem Wintu in order to create this dam. In other words, this contained a great part of this, these sacred sites. At the moment, the government wants to raise the wall of that dam by another 18 feet in order to comply with the interests of the powerful agricultural sector in California, because you know it's dry. So, if they do that, it will wipe out the remainder of the traditional territory of the Winnemem Wintu. They're fighting an uphill battle. As I said, they are not federally recognized. And they are, I think they number something like 225 at the moment. In Australia, I have the traditional owners of a site in Borulula in the Northern Territories. Um, which particularly interests me because the Northern Territories was the first portion or the first province to have sacred site legislation, but it's not particularly protective for them. There's a whole loophole there. Um, we have there a, an artist's design of the MacArthur River mine at the bottom. It's one of the world's biggest zinc and copper and nickel mines. This mine has severe environmental concerns. It is on the MacArthur River, but they want to double its size. And the government is very much in favor of this development because it brings in foreign currency um, and, of course, it creates jobs. So there's that same basic problem. And then when I get too depressed, I work on my New Zealand case study which I have included by way of contrast. You may have heard about the Wanganui River thing. It's been a lot in the news recently. Wanganui River is the river that recently was endowed with what they call legal human personality. 
And I would like to emphasize that it is not juristic personality. It, it truly is akin to human personality. Um, that precedent, by the way, has now been followed in India twice. They first gave that to two main Indian rivers, and then yesterday or the day before, that was also extended to two glaciers in the Himalayas that feed these holy rivers. So, that is my spot of hope. Two key concepts that I want to briefly share with you. Natural resource development projects. And what I would like to point out is we mostly think of them as what I have in the bottom there. But natural resource development can also be what we have up top. In other words, uh, tourism, for instance, typically like the ski resort that they have um, that they want to have in Jumbo Mountain, that type of thing. Sacred indigenous sites, I could talk about it the whole afternoon, I won't, to your great relief, but it is a Western concept. There is no such thing as a sacred indigenous site. That is a very reductive notion. So we need to tread carefully. But that has a number of implications. Um, for instance, we tend to categorize things very much from our Western perspective. And therefore, we think that a sacred site is something like a structure. Whereas in indigenous um, belief systems, most likely it is going to be a landscape. There may be, there may be a structure involved, but it will likely go towards a landscape. That has an immediate relation in the sense that a church or a mosque or a synagogue can be consecrated and deconsecrated. You cannot do that with an indigenous landscape. I mean, it's there. It can't be moved. You can't substitute it with another one. So you see, there's a basic problematic. But we will move sharply on from there. I want to show you just why this is such a great crisis in Standing Rock. And please excuse my many news flashes. What we see is we have militarized the energy industry with a governor who believes that you can treat Indian people poorly. Three years ago, a woman froze to death on the Standing Rock Reservation because she couldn't pay her heating bill. And now you're planning a $3.9 billion pipeline that will help nobody but oil companies. It's really infrastructure for oil companies and not for people. So this first one being the political strategy, let me quickly show you the map there. Uh, it's not the whole Dakota Access Pipeline that you see up there. It's the salient portion that goes past the Standing Rock and the Cheyenne River reservations. They are the two that will be in litigation that I will touch on briefly later on. But that is there where you have the um, lake away is where the Standing Rock protest camps sprang up. And that, you can see, that's a, a picture of the, or two pictures of the protest camp that was taken quite a while apart. It went on for months and months. In the bitter cold of winter, they were very adamant about this. Hopefully with the background of sacred sites, you're starting to see why they are very adamant about this. Um, the numbers varied and the estimates varied, but at one stage they were they think that there were up to 10,000 people there. So this was a very serious movement. And also it constituted the face of indigenous protests movement, protest movements. Um, it galvanized a great many people. There were more than 300 United States tribes represented there. There were tribes, there were indigenous people coming from as far away as New Zealand, for instance. Um, and also, there was an alliance between environmental activists, indigenous activists, and so on. However, the state met it with rather nasty response. That is from the private security firm, Dakota Access LLC, sent, set their dogs loose on them. The security guards set the dogs loose. What is bad about it is that the police were standing there and just observing. At least six people were bitten. As for the police, you can see they were in full riot gear. 
they, uh, the protesters at all times, at, or water protectors as they prefer to be known, at all times were not, um, had no weapons on them. So, what the police did is they maced them, they tear gassed them. The bottom two pictures is where they sprayed them with water cannons in sub-zero temperatures. They arrested them, they subjected them to all sorts of, I think, unconstitutional strip searches. Uh, the cases are still ongoing. Rather ironically, this changed, the position changed, when about 2,000 US veterans came to protect the, U the water protectors against the police and the military. And you have some pictures of that. So on 4 December last year, the Obama administration did an about face and said that they were going to do an environmental impact study, which lasted until the 24th of January this year, with the very first day of President Trump in office, when he issued a presidential memorandum in which he said Dakota access goes on. And subsequently, they reversed everything. So that has been the political strategy to date. Uh, you know that after that they vacated the sites, it was rather more nasty. If we look at their legal strategy, and I'm going to pass through this very quickly, there is a legal case that is ongoing. My reference today is to the two motions for urgent injunctions that have been brought so far. Both of these were unsuccessful. They were unsuccessful for different reasons, and they were brought on different bases, but they both were brought for, on the basis that there had to be protection for sacred sites. The first one was brought by the Standing Rock Sioux against the U.S. Army Corps, Corps of Engineers. Um, Dakota Access joined as an interested party. So, they based it on the Section 106 consultation procedure of the National Historic Pre Preservation Act, which they said was not complied with. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail of that. I will just say that according to the court, they did not meet with the, the high standards of proof that were necessary for an injunction. Very interestingly, though, Justice Boasberg said he was not capable of offering the Standing Rock Sioux tribe any meaningful assistance with the law that was available to him. Now I cite, he says, Powerless to prevent these harms, given the current posture of the case, the court cannot consider them likely to occur in the absence of the relief sought here. Put simply, any such harms are destined to ensue whether or not the court grants the injunction that the tribe desires. As Standing Rock acknowledges, Dakota Access has demonstrated that it is determined to build the pipeline right up to the water's edge, regardless of whether it has secured a permit to, to then build it across. Like the cause, the court, the court is unable to stop it from doing so. So my point simply, that strategy did not work for them. On to injunction two. The Cheyenne River tribe here follows a different tack. They, at this stage, the pipeline was fully built. They were trying to get an injunction to stop oil from flowing through the pipeline. I am almost done. Uh, and they said that there was an ancient prophecy in terms of which the pipeline was the black snake against which their ancestors had warned. That would desecrate the water. The water is sacred to them. If the pipeline is under the lake, that will unbalance the water and they can no longer use the water in their religious ceremonies. Again, the court said, and the, the court was really very sympathetic towards them, but there is a very nasty precedent in the United States law called Ling. And Ling, of course, is binding on a district court, being a Supreme Court case. So here the, the court said, 
The court readily recognizes the sordid chronicle of the United States dispossessing the, the Lakota people of swaths of land and takes seriously that the tribe feels such deep oppression as to warrant analogy to prisoner cases. Yet, Ling expressly cautions that measuring the effects of a governmental action on a religious objective's spiritual government is not the proper inquiry when the challenged action is the federal government's management of its own land. So again, no remedy for them. I could say much more about that, I won't, because of the time. Instead, I'm going to leave you with a citation from Winona LeDuke. It's her that you heard earlier on. And she said, The question of who gets to determine the destiny of the land and of the people who live on it, those with the money or those who prey on the land, is a question that is alive throughout society. Merci beaucoup.